much to all of you for, for coming tonight. Uh, I think that was a very powerful uh, introduction by Loki. And I'd like to just take a few minutes to look a bit behind imperialism and what drives it. Because after the end of the Cold War, there was a tendency to portray imperialism as something of the past, something that had been superseded by a, a liberal New World Order. But I think in the last nine years in particular, since the 9-11 attacks, the brutal US-British imposition of force, invasion and occupation across the Arab and Muslim world in particular makes that kind of view impossible to sustain. And of course there's been an intense revival of interest uh, and focus on imperialism across the world. Uh, and especially when it's seen that the US dominated world order is the first genuinely global empire in history. But to impose imperialism you have to understand it and grasp what drives it. And we've had empires of course throughout history uh, and today's imperialism grew out of European colonialism the European colonialism that has shaped the entire history of the world over the last 500 years. But under modern capitalism, imperialism in essence is the use of force and coercion in all its forms abroad to extort, extort profits above what can be obtained through ordinary commercial exchange. And that is what drives the imperial Order. Now, in the colonial period, of course, imperialism took the form of direct political and military control. Of course, we've seen the recent attempts by mainstream media figures, historians, and even politicians like Gordon Brown to rehabilitate colonialism, to say we should stop apologising for it. Now, of course, the apologies never began, and anyone who lived under colonialism knows that it was a racist despotism uh, built on ethnic cleansing, enslavement, war and savage repression and merciless exploitation which underdeveloped vast areas of the world. And in the 20th century socialist revolutions and anti-colonial movements took huge parts of the globe out of the control of imperialism. And the result was that in the second half of the 20th century the US became the unchallenged global capitalist power. Its rivals like Britain, its earlier rivals like Britain, became its auxiliaries. And imperialism took the, for, the established US form of indirect control, enforced through regular invasions and interventions, the control of foreign investment and global trade rules. Effectively, a US dominated system of global corporate power underpinned by military force, which of course has delivered the widest north-south divide in history, wider even in terms of income and living standards than under colonialism itself. Nowadays, when you talk like this, to be accused uh, of anti-Americanism. But of course, that accusation is an absurdity. You're dealing with a system of overwhelming US power and domination, even now after the events of the last few years which have undermined them. You're talking about United States military forces in a majority of countries in the world. You're talking about an arms budget which is 20 times bigger, sorry, which is bigger than the 20 uh, next military powers in the world combined. And you're talking about uh, a system of power which is backed by US allies that dominates the world. Now, people say, well, isn't China maybe uh, an imperialist power in the making? Or some people I saw on the website for this meeting, someone saying, well, what about Islamic imperialism? I mean, this is dreaming and a refusal to face reality. Now, it's possible that in the future, if capitalism continues to develop in China, that it might become an imperial power. When we're talking about the Islamic empire of the past, that's another thing entirely. You've got to focus on the reality of power and wealth in the world if you want to understand what imperialism really is. Now, 
Britain had now has a permanent subaltern status to American power, but it remains itself an imperialist power. Not just because it joins those American military interventions and wars, but it does so because of the globalised imperial structure of the British economy, its dependence on the City of London in particular and parasitic foreign investment, more than any other power, major power in the world. And that's what ties the British establishment to US interests. Now, since 2001, we've seen the naked face of this new imperialism in the war on terror. The invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq in particular, the orgy of state terror that that unleashed, the mass of state kidnapping, torture, and hundreds of thousands of dead, and US and Western-backed interventions and occupations in Palestine, Lebanon, Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen. And of course, that's not a comprehensive list. And it's not a coincidence that all those countries I mentioned, all those areas and states that I mentioned, are all former British colonies subject to divide and rule and the legacy of that in this era. And nor is it of course a coincidence, a coincidence that they're all countries in the Arab and Muslim world. Both because of course that is the centre of global oil reserves, to state the bleeding obvious, but also because that part of the world is not in a real sense fully decolonized. It's the only part of the world I would say that that's true of if you look at the system of semi-colonial domination and control throughout the Gulf in the Arab and Muslim world. And it's also because of the mobilization of resistance, particularly the mobilization through Islam in the recent period against imperial control of this region. And of course, all this process has been underpinned by the grotesque veneer of human rights intervention. The idea that somehow all these interventions, these wars and invasions that have unleashed such suffering and misery are driven by a concern to spread Western values or universal values throughout uh, these benighted parts of the world. While of course the whole process has fueled racism and Islamophobia throughout the occupying countries, just as in the traditional forms of imperialism, the power of colonies and colonialism was bolstered by a grotesque racist ideology, the claims of Christian civilization and Western supremacism. So what is imperialism? It's war, occupation, invasion, as Loki was saying. It's barbarism, barbarism in the service of Western corporate power, global exploitation, and inequality. But it's not just wrong, it's not just a morally repugnant order which denies self-determination and stunts development across the world, though it is all those things. Modern imperialism is the other side of the coin of neoliberal capitalism, which has caused havoc and is causing havoc now across the imperialist countries themselves. And in Britain, the, particularly, it's precisely those financial and city interests which drive and, underpeer and underpin Britain's own imperialist role, which have been so obviously disastrous for the mass of people in this country and are now driving the process of cuts and attacks on the welfare state here. But there is another side, another side of this picture, which is maybe the more positive one. Now, the past decade has been a period of huge global crimes. But it's also been one, I would argue, of historic advances. First of all, the war on terror and the resistance to it, particularly in Iraq and now Afghanistan and elsewhere in the Arab and Muslim world, has in fact exposed the limits of US military and Western imperial power. Second, the global crisis has at the very least begun the essential process of discrediting the neoliberal model that underpins it. Third, the rise of China has not only brought millions out of poverty, and I know there's 
controversial aspects of court and, of course, in the, of, the, of that process. But it's also begun the process of a creation of a new centre of power in what is becoming a multipolar world. And finally, the wave of progressive change in Latin America has challenged imperialism and neoliberalism, those two twins of the modern world. And most importantly, is destroying the ridiculous and reactionary claim that there is no alternative to the form of neoliberal capitalism that has been imposed on the world since 1991. Now, for those of us in Britain and other Western and imperial powers, our job is both to expose and impose imperialism, the imperialism of our own governments. It's also to support those resisting imperialism around the world and to fight for an alternative to the economic order that drives that imperialism and is destroying lives and livelihoods here in Britain and across the Western world. Now I know people in the progressive movement or the radical movement or the labour movement, many different movements have tended to be pessimistic uh, in the pe recent periods. But I would say the experience of the anti-war movement in Britain and across the world, which is an anti-imperialist movement, the growing movement that we've seen in recent months driven by students against the cuts in this country. And this very meeting itself shows that that process is already well underway. Thanks very much. Woo!